Ruth Hardy from Middlebury, Vermont. Um, thank you to the committee for providing me with the opportunity to testify on S-22, which would require a waiting period and safe storage for firearms. It was the first bill I worked on after my election last November. My desire to help ensure Vermont has common sense gun safety laws was a, one motivation for why I ran for office. I approached this desire for change from a variety of perspectives. I grew up in a family that owned guns. My father learned to use a gun growing up in rural upstate New York. My brother hunted waterfowl and practiced target shooting in our hay field. Just last year, I myself ventured into skeet shooting, and I'm a pretty good shot. Uh, I'm supportive of a person's ability to safely own and enjoy using a gun for sport and hobby. I know that the vast majority of Vermont gun owners are safe and responsible. I'm a former school board member who, in the name of protecting students from gun violence, discussed gun safety plans and training with administrators, added funding to budgets to support safety-related upgrades to buildings, and deliberated with colleagues about proper consequences for students who brought a weapon to school. I'm an advocate for women's rights and safety. We have seen in Vermont and nationwide that guns are often used as weapons of fear and control against women in domestic violence situations. Access to a gun in a domestic violence situation makes it five times more likely that a woman will be killed. Most importantly, I am the mother of three teenage children who are growing up in an era when firearms are the second leading cause of death for American teens and children. And learning how to protect yourself from an active shooter at school is now a, re a required part of the curriculum. My youngest child was in first grade at the time of the Newtown school shooting, the same age as the children's killed. That tragedy devastated me as a mother. That was the first time I contacted my elected officials asking them to improve our gun safety laws. Two years later, when my oldest child was in ninth grade, one of her classmates committed suicide with a gun he accessed in his own home. From 2011 to 2016, 16 teenagers in Vermont committed suicide with a gun. Last year, I brought students to the State House on several occasions to testify in committees and speak with legislators about their experiences growing up in this reality and why they support common sense gun safety laws. I'm grateful that the governor and the legislator finally decided to act. I think there's more to do. And that is why I worked with Senators Baruth and Clarkson to introduce S-22. During the time we were drafting the bill, a young man committed suicide in Chittenden County. His parents called for a waiting period before the purchase of a firearm, so others who are rashly buying guns to, to take their own lives have to wait what could be a life-saving two days before obtaining a gun. During the time we were drafting the bill, two eighth grade boys at my youngest child's school, the Middlebury Union Middle School, discussed with their friends a plan to steal guns from a relative and bring them to school to shoot a classmate they disliked. Their plan was halted because one of their friends told his mother and she reported it to school officials. Following this incident, just weeks after I was elected, I was on the phone a lot with worried parents, stressed school officials, and diligent law enforcement officers. I was dealing with the stress and fear of my own kids also, knowing that this type of thing could happen in their own school with kids they knew. My son, who was in first grade during the Newtown shooting, was now in seventh grade when it all almost happened in his town. One constituent who contacted me with suggestions for S-22 said, I own a few guns and I like to shoot and hunt. I don't have an issue with reasonable restrictions and as a father of two kids, you better believe I keep my guns locked up. 
That thing at the middle school actually made me go out and buy new locks for all of them. Unfortunately, not all guns are stored safely, and some can be accessed by people who need to do harm to themselves or others. Some can be accessed by kids too young to know better. Waiting periods and safe storage work hand in hand. If guns are stored safely, then most people who shouldn't have access to them, including people who want to do harm to themselves or others, can't get them. And if there are waiting periods for people to buy guns, then most people who shouldn't have access to them, including people who want to do harm to themselves and others, can't get them. I respect the committee process in the Vermont legislature. I know that how hard my committees work to improve the bills that are sent to us before we send them back out. I know that some portions of bills get removed so that others may advance. I understand that the waiting period language may be more palatable to members of the committee than the safe storage language, but I believe they work best together. There is sufficient technology to allow gun owners the ability to easily access their own guns while also keeping them locked away from those who shouldn't have them. There is language to more precisely define locking advices, devices, and storage compartments that would do away with ambiguity. There are mechanisms for smoothly competing, completing a purchase transaction 48 hours after it is initiated. There are some who say safe storage laws are not enforceable and therefore we shouldn't have them. But in talking to a law enforcement officer in my community, he told me that there are numerous laws that are not enforceable. He said that in his opinion though, laws are a statement of what our community regards as acceptable. I know that our community regards the safe storage of guns acceptable. Most Vermonters support common sense gun laws. The voters of my district elected me knowing that I would come and advocate for gun safety legislation. I know that kids are watching our actions to see what we as adults, what we as the leaders of Vermont are, regard as acceptable. I believe that keeping kids safe in school, women safe in their homes, and people who are struggling safe from themselves is what is most acceptable. As one of your newest colleagues, I'm asking you to support a 48-hour waiting period and safe storage for firearms. Thank you for your time and your work. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Thank you all. I appreciate the time. And I do have
kegs of beer and all that guys to other Asian drinkers, and they were charged um, with various law under various laws and so on. Curious about that. Yeah, yeah, I'll look into the civil liability issue. Uh, maybe there needs to be an education of people as to the civil laws of the state regarding their responsibilities. I'm not just talking about guns. That's a good call. Hey, Chris, thank you for being here, and I'm sorry about cutting you short last week. <coughs> Please feel free to begin wherever you want to begin. Uh, I'd like to start again. My testimony is slightly different, <coughs> and uh, thank you for uh, bringing me up. Um, and especially thank you for the public hearing <coughs> last night. Um, uh, I know that it, uh, it's very time consuming, so thank you. I just want to mention how grateful I was to uh, Vermont Technical College. I thought that was a great venue, uh, I, and I think that on the way back, the committee was talking about how much more comfortable people seemed. At a public hearing a venue like that but rather than in the state house in a bubble house where people are crowded in and uh, just seemed like people seem much more comfortable there but i was con i confess i was a little concerned with the, the parking and uh, but it really worked out well yeah. yes indeed uh, for the record my name is chris bradley uh, i have the honor of representing the vermont federation of sportsmen's clubs and i wish to thank you for providing uh, the federation an opportunity to speak before this committee in the packet of information I previously provided, there are individual statements concerning S1, S2, and S13. The Federation actively and vigorously supports all three of these bills, as we believe it corrects several deficiencies and oversights that resulted from the rather unsettling speed with which things were pushed through the House last year. While we support all three, we are critically concerned about the passage of S1, as this is, this is a time-sensitive bill. Failure to pass S1 will have a negative effect on competitive shooting in Vermont. It will result in out-of-state competitors deciding not to come to Vermont. It will result in lost revenue to Vermont businesses where these tourists spend money. And it will absolutely financially hurt clubs and associations that work very hard to support and grow a sport that is recognized at the national and Olympic levels. The Federation therefore urges the Senate to pass S1 as it is and to do so with all due speed. I will now devote the remainder of my time to addressing S22. <clears throat> as there are two components of S22, I'd like to address the second part first, uh, mandatory safe storage. As far as this portion is concerned, the Federation believes that this was fully addressed in the SCOTUS, uh, uh, Supreme Court in the United States versus in D.C. versus Eller. We believe that this will be impossible to enforce. We believe this will negatively impact the ability to defend oneself, one's home, and their loved ones. And we believe that this bill creates bizarre situations where a person is in violation by simply moving about in his or her house. We strongly oppose this portion and ask that it be dropped from further consideration. Regarding the first portion of S22, the mandatory waiting period, the Federation remains unequivocal. Suicide is a tragedy that has touched just about everyone, including myself. It is the Federation's understanding that the primary impetus of the consideration of these bills that won't act a waiting period on the purchase of a firearm is to address people who impulsively act to kill themselves by buying a firearm. In the 2017 report entitled Suicide Attempt Morbidity Data Brief from the Vermont Department of Mental Health, we see there were 118 suicide deaths among Vermont residents, and we see that firearms accounted for 52% of those deaths. This was followed by 21% who killed themselves by suffocation, 17% who killed themselves by poison, with the remaining 10% being caused by other reasons such as drowning, intentional motor vehicle crash, and falls. Looking beyond these tragedies, however, is telling, as there were 200 hospitalizations and 823 emergency department visits for suicide attempts among Vermont residents that occurred in Vermont hospitals. This does not include less severe cases who may have been treated in a physician's office, outpatient facility, or by an EMT. Also not captured are people who have suicidal thoughts, make a suicide plan, 
or have depressive disorders and do not act with the healthcare system for whatever reason. We can therefore surmise that the number of, total number of people in jeopardy is much, much higher than the 1,023 mentioned above. According to this data brief, for the period of 2015 to 2016, poisoning accounted for 55% of the emergency uh, department hospitalizations for self-harm. These were attempted suicides. 31% were for cutting piercing. Other causes, which were unspecified or not classified, accounted for 10%. Suffocation accounted for 2%. Fire and burning, as well as firearms, accounted for 1%. I will not state that these people who made the, those 1,023 documented suicide attempts really did intend to kill themselves. I will, however, suggest that it is reasonable to believe that a significant majority of those that attempted to kill themselves really did intend to end their lives. And I wish to make the following points. In considering this bill, the Federation sees a, a problem in attempting to achieve a balance between an individual's constitutional right of self-defense versus the establishment of a waiting period that might possibly delay a person from using a gun to commit suicide. According to the Vermont Judiciary Annual Statistical Report for 2018, there were 3,380 relief from abuse filings in 2018, which was an increase of 8% in the filings from 2017. For those RFA filings, which become court orders, these cases represent situations where a victim is able to convince a court that they are under a real threat of bodily injury or even deaths from another, such that the court will issue an order to keep the parties separated. In these situations, a victim has been able to prove that they live under some acceptable level of risk or threat, which may and can include death, and we believe it likely that some of these victims may well want to take the very prudent step of obtaining the means of self-defense to preserve their own life. They have that right. An example of such a situation would be the case of Carol Bowen, formerly a resident of Burling Township, New Jersey. When Carol Bowen felt the threat of domestic violence, the petite hairdresser took steps to protect herself. Ms. Bowen had gotten a restraining order against her former boyfriend. She installed security cameras and alarm system at her home, and she then began the process of obtaining a handgun for self-defense. But it wasn't enough. Bone, 39, was stabbed to death in the driveway of her home by her ex-boyfriend while she waited for her pistol. Carol Bone was in fear. She took all the steps she could, and because she was not able to defend, to, to obtain what is arguably the best means of defense, she was not able to defend herself from the attack that she herself foresaw. I could provide a litany of similar stories, as there are many. Using that single case as an example, however, is it reasonable, fair, or constitutional to subject a potential victim to any waiting period when any delay might well make the difference between saving their own life or preventing injury? How do we balance the rights of a person who wishes to preserve their life versus a person who is intent on ending theirs? And can, and can no provision be made in this bill to address that situation? People who already own firearms. In many cases, a person who owns firearms wants to buy another firearm. They will typically use the same FFL. This is certainly not always the case, but generally speaking, it is. In a situation where an FFL knows that the purchaser already owns a firearm, what purpose is served by delaying the possession? I quote from a 2017 study by the Harvard School of Public Health, quote, when we compare people in gun-owning households to people not in gun-owning households, there was no difference in terms of the rates of mental illness or in the terms of the proportion saying that they had seriously considered suicide. Gun owners are not more suicidal. The intent F of S22 seems very specific. It is intended to prevent a first-time buyer who is suicidal from acting on impulse. If that is the case, Shouldn't this bill create an exception that allows someone who already owns a firearm to be exempt from this waiting period? Number three, people plan. It is the Federation's view that the establishment of an arbitrary time limit will not work for the simple reason that people plan, and we have seen this time and time again. 
It is also clear that the suggested time limits are somewhat arbitrary, since H59 has a waiting period of 72 hours, S22 is suggested 48, and others are suggesting 24. Whatever the time limit that is imposed, this cannot and will not guarantee that a person involved will be stopped from attempting to take their own life. If a 24-hour waiting period had been in place last year, we are led to believe that that 24-hour waiting period would have made all the difference. I ask you, will it be any less heartbreaking situation when somebody waits a day and then kills himself in the 25th hour? If we were to make it a week, would it be less tragic for the person who waited that week plus one day? Do we tweak this law each time? Four, statistics and the rest of the story. Organizations like Gun Sense Vermont reference a study published in 2015 by the American Journal of Public Health, and they relate the claim that, quote, waiting periods for gun pur purchases have a 51% fewer gun suicides and 27% fewer suicides overall, which sounds very impressive. I quote from this study, Objectives, using previous research, we examine the impact of four handgun laws, waiting periods, universal background checks, gun laws, and open carry required regulations on suicide rates. Methods, we use publicly available databases to collect information on statewide laws, suicide rates, and demographic characteristics for 2013. Results, each law was passed, well, excuse me, each law was associated with significantly lower firearm suicide rates and the proportion of suicides relating from firearms. In addition, each law, except for that which required a waiting period, was associated with an overall lower suicide rate. So, while this study does show that a waiting period reduces suicides by firearms, there is apparently no corresponding decrease in overall suicides, which can only mean that people will simply find another means if they encounter a waiting period. Five, effect on gun shows, gun clubs, banquets, auctions, and similar venues. As a final point, but extremely important to sporting groups, individual sportsmen, sportswomen, and local economies would be the negative effect of any waiting period on the long-established venues of gun shows, sports banquets, where firearms are possible prizes. As an aside here, um, these venues provide an outlet a, for First Amendment rights uh, among gun owners and sports people. This is a place where we can get together, share information, uh, and, and alert people to things that are moving. While there is much information about gun shows, gun shows provide a historical venue that allows both large and small firearms dealers, FFLs, to sell their wares to the public. FFLs have to compete not only with one another, but also compete with FFLs from other states, especially with rifles and shotguns. A citizen wanting to buy a firearm need only travel to New Hampshire or Maine to buy a rifle or a shotgun. No waiting period, and no for New Hampshire, no tax. For FFLs who attend gun shows, we believe there will be a decline in attendance for the simple reason that their purpose to be there is to sell, and as they count on leaving with less inventory than what they came with. If an FFL cannot sell a firearm directly to a purchaser after a next check, the FFL will be less incentivized and why would they travel to the gun shows in the first place? For citizens who attend gun shows, we believe that they likely, there will likewise be a decrease in attendance, as these folks would know they could look, but not bring home. If they did decide to buy, and that decision happened to be on a Sunday, then the purchaser would then have to consider the loss of time and money to drive to wherever the FFL resides at some later time so that the sale could be officially completed. Combined, less FFLs mean less displays, less displays mean less incentive for citizens to attend, less citizens attending is far less reason for FFLs to even go. Above and beyond being a social event that allows for the gathering of like-minded people and provides a venue for a wide variety of vendors to sell all sorts of outdoor items that are not firearms, gun shows are a very real and very significant source of revenue to sporting clubs that host them. Examples of such events would be the Berry Gun Show, put on by the Berry Fish and Game, and the Morrisville Gun Show, put on annually by the Memorial Valley Fish and Game Club, in addition to several others. Gun shows also bring significant revenue into their host town, such as Berry, Essex Junction, and Rutland. If any waiting period is enacted, 
This will have an adverse effect on all vendors who traditionally see value in paying for a table and then displaying their wares. For vendors selling firearms, this is even worse, as they will likely stop going at all if the waiting period exceeds the length of time of the gun show, meaning that the purchaser will have to make multiple trips, first to the gun show to discover what they want, and then another trip to the vendor's store sometime later to adhere to the waiting period. In a similar vein, many sporting groups raise much needed funds through banquets, and many of these banquets provide firearms as prizes. Examples of such banquets would be the Vermont Sports Shooting Association, Federation, the Vermont Trappers Association, and the Vermont Bear Hunts Association, and others. A similar impact will be seen on auctions, such as what are run by Thomas Hershack and Merrill Auction House. I now return to that number of 1,141 suicide attempts in Vermont, of which 118 were successful. Of those 1,141 suicide attempts, about 5% were related to firearms. I would be sure that everyone in this room would agree that the best approach to solving the problem of suicide would be to address why people are being motivated to end their lives and find ways to help, as this approach would address 100% of the people who are at risk. Instead, there appears to be a laser focus not on the cause, but the manner, based on one single event, with only a handful of similar events occurring across the past 20 years. This laser focus, by the way, targets only the method which 5% of the people at risk employ, while doing nothing to address the methods the other 95% employ. Isn't the problem all about suicides, not just suicides with guns? In summary, the Federation does not understand, it does understand, the intent of a waiting period. We are not, however, convinced it will save anyone's life. And when push comes to shove, we very clearly see an unreasonable restriction to the unalienable, unalienable right of self-defense. For the above reasons and others, the Federation must respectfully oppose S-22. If this is to pass, that is to pass, we encourage considerations for the changes to the points I raised above. Thank you for your time. Is there any questions of me? I've got a few. Uh, have that me. Well, it's not happening. <laughs> um, I think they're, they're related to my concern here. And I absolutely agree with you regarding the shooting contest and S1 and the importance of that bill. Um, as you know, last year, many of us tried to amend what was S-55, Governor eventually signed. We felt that the House had made a huge mistake in outlawing the shooting contests um, as of uh, this July 1st. And we were unable to do that. Um, the, the process, unfortunately, was don't change a word in this bill because we don't want to have a conference committee and deals were made with the House and so forth. And I won't get into all the nature of those deals. There may be disagreement uh, about what really happened, but from my perspective as chair of this committee, uh, the process, once it got to the Senate floor and the House floor, were out of our control. And so if we were to pass S1, and I think we would probably get five votes, um, who knows what would get added to it? Uh, it would be another, it could be another S55. And that's my fear. Um, you know, I've, even, I've introduced a bill, S72, that uh, there's some opposition, but haven't seemed to generate the same opposition. It's, uh, it's merely an uh, amendment to the extreme risk protection laws and uh, allowing data to be collected nationwide and at Vermont participate in that data collection. Um, but my concern is, is that, um, I think Ed Cutler used the term powers when he spoke, and to him that meant, you know, what's gonna get added? I wonder what your thoughts are to that, if there's any fear on the part of the Federation um, that once it gets to the floor, the House or Senate, it's out of control. It gets out of control, and who knows what might be added. Uh, two points. Um, 
and it would be my direct experience <clears throat> that the Senate Judiciary is a far more deliberative body. And because he would be the committee of origin, this bill would come back to this committee. Uh, regarding um, briefly on S72, um, it would be the Federation's uh, position that uh, effective reporting would be a good idea. The second provision, we, uh, as far as the medical professional may report, um, certainly some concerns there, but I think that's what we really would like to see, better reporting from the medical community. So uh, at this point, uh, we offer no strong objection to S72. Uh, S1, at the 11th hour, uh, in 59 minutes, um, in the Donny Brook that was uh, the lead up to the passage of S55 in the House, um, there was a last minute break where uh, Ann Donahue and myself uh, gave testimony to the House Judiciary in a special break that they arranged. Um, and we pointed out the uh, overlooked factor of, of competitive shooting in Vermont. Um, it was my understanding at that point that they willingly put in the uh, exemption for competitors coming in from out of state, which can be proved. People, a competitor coming in from out of state pre-registers. They're not going to come to a match that they may not have a place for if they're coming in from out of state. Um, furthermore, I think there's a question of the definition of import that was never defined in that bill, and whether import really means you bring in goods or services to sell, or whether it's just transitory, there's coming in and they're going to leave with it. Um, but it was our impression that uh, the House was receptive, the House Judiciary understood the competitions, they simply wanted more time to, dis to d discuss it, which is why they then turned around and gave us a sunset. So I, I can't. I listened all last night and didn't say anything, and I've listened this morning, but I do want to point out that S55 is seen different ways by different people. There are many, many thousands of people in Vermont who rejoice that finally the legislature acted in an environment of mass shootings, one after the other, and we nearly had one here, and finally the House and the Senate managed to pass bills that the governor signed. So call it a Donnie Brook, call it horrific, whatever you want to call it. I, I didn't call it horrific. I, I call it historic, and I call it action that is not the last word on gun safety. So that's all I'll say. I appreciate your perspective, Senator. I don't mean to demean it. I, we, several of us may have different perspectives on S55. Yeah. I think there was unanimous agreement on the um, so-called red flag or extremist protection order bill, which was yeah. used in Middlebury, which was used in our <coughs> Fairhaven um, and some other places as well. It's been used quite often, uh, more than I expected it, frankly. I think there were <coughs> What became the issue, really, for me, was some of the things that were in the magazine ban that never was debated in the Senate, never debated in this committee. Um, we certainly had our debate about other aspects of the bill, the waiting period, and so forth. And we all knew that. But the magazine ban was never a topic here. And all of a sudden, it came at us, and we couldn't even amend it. That's what I was talking about. So just to be clear, um, that was I do have another question about different, a little different subject. Certainly, sir. On the waiting periods, there appears that I've tried to understand the statistics, but each side has their own statistics, so it's hard to fiddle through them. But I did notice several states have waiting periods that are, you know, they range from 10 days to one day or 24 hours to. But some states um, have exempted uh, long rifles, rifles and shotguns, or you know, just for handguns purchase. Are you familiar with any of those? Um, I am familiar with this. Would that help to deal with your gun show problem? 
No, I really don't believe it would. Um, I, black powder is not regulated. It is just as lethal. It killed many people in the Civil War, and that's completely unregulated. Um, I, I believe uh, shotguns, rifles are just as lethal to commit suicide with um, as any other method of, of suicide. When I, when I buy a golf club, uh, I often have a waiting period. I go to a pro shop, went to Dave Susie one time, said I needed a, a five foot, uh, and I'm left handed, and he said, I'll see what I can do it. And it took him a couple of weeks to get a five foot left handed. Um, you know, so I was effectively in a waiting period there. I go to the expo in Albany, they have a golf expo actually it's this weekend. Anybody who wants to go, welcome to it. It's a great deal. They have a lot of different pros there selling their wear and clothes and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> but if I want to get something new, I got to order it and it gets shipped to me. So effectively, that's a waiting period at a show. I don't know if they. Uh, in answer to that, Senator, I don't believe it's a constitutional right to have a golf club, um, in difference to a firearm, uh, and, and just to... Uh, well, I just want to point out it's a waiting period uh, that has been imposed, mm -hmm. particularly on one um, I'm not particularly a golfer. I do an extra long shaft, so well, I, I certainly can... Some of my friends over here who are, they're kind of smiling because they've been through the same thing. Mm -hmm. I just was pointing out that there, you don't always get what you... Actually, at a gun show, I don't know, but at, a, at other expos, you, you order what you think you might want. They don't have the full stock there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, just um, last night, some several uh, persons testifying mentioned this, and it's been an issue that we've discussed before. But with regard to the next check, several persons last night said that it's not people are or mental health facilities or hospitals or doctors aren't sending in information to NICS, and therefore, when someone goes in and gets a record check, the person isn't showing up. Do you have any familiarity with the um, flaws in that system? I believe there was a statute passed uh, a couple of years back concerning the fact that Vermont had not been forwarding records on mental health issues to NICS. Um, certainly, we've heard from Ledge Council that there are uh, exemptions from HIPAA that allow medical professionals, especially in, in cases of extreme risk, to, to make those points known. Um, I think that's a necessary component. It's a component we're, we're not really talking about. But thankfully, the S-72 does uh, attempt to address that, but in all honesty, it's a may, not a shall. Um, until such time as, as we make a commitment to the cause of suicide, and, and what is driving these people, whether it's an edu educational at, at, at schools, uh, whether it's a, a public health campaign, uh, public service announcements to, to engage directly people at risk, I'm not sure we're going to see any. In fact, I, I'm pretty convinced that we're going to continue to see more suicides. Um, Senator White. I, I think that there, um, there's a question to the testimony last night. I think there's a, a lot of misunderstanding about who gets um, reported to the NICS around mental health because they, fed, the federal says anybody with a mental health issue. And we limited it to just people who've been adjudicated and are under the um, supervision of the... So there are lots of people running around with mental health issues that aren't reported and they shouldn't be reported. We already made that decision. But the people with, I believe the people who have are under the Supervision are being reported now. Well, could, could one of the law clerks we check just, on that? Please. Just check and make sure that we are reporting people to NICS that are under the supervision. If they're on a hospitalization or a non hospitalization order, they're supposed to be reported. Can, to can somebody just check call. to see that the laws have been passed? Yes. yes. I remember when we passed that. Yeah. It yeah. requires, after a person's been found in danger, to themselves. <laughs> They're, they're under the, the supervision of you. That's right. Um, so they did do those several times last night. Yeah. Right. But I think that, yes, because I think the people 
think that anybody with a mental health issue is supposed to be being reported, right. because that's the way the federal but that's not the way we work. I, I understand uh, in my previous yeah. packet, I, the Federation went to some significant lengths to look at what sort of systems might be put in place to share information so that FFL, at the point in time of the sale, might be able to be made privy to information that if they were aware of, they would not make that sale. But frankly, this is a, a privacy issue. This is this has been rather closely protected, and for some very good reasons. People don't want to. Uh, there are people who won't seek help for the stigma that may result, or or the, the simple reason that there may be fallout for them seeking help. Veterans are a, a case in point here. Um, uh, Can I ask another question? Sure. How do you interpret immediate possession or control in the safe storage? Um, is, is I read that it says outside, if you leave a firearm outside his or her immediate possession or control, what, how, how does that get interpreted? Um, you know, it, have it, your hands on it? Uh, frankly, if, it's, if I leave the room that that firearm is in, I believe it's out of my possession and immediate control. So if in fact, in the previous example, if I get up in the middle of the night to uh, go to the bathroom and I have a firearm in my uh, uh, bed stand, um, I am no longer in control. Um, I would suggest that, uh, that Vermont is an incredibly safe state. We, we don't really have uh, it, it issues that other states deal with in terms of firearms, and, and it's a, very much an educational issue. Uh, youth growing up in Vermont are, 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 have the advantage uh, of having such things as, as hunter safety courses. Um, that used to be fairly widely. I mean, Boy Scouts would do this. Um, this was a, a common thing. Um, why are we doing this in schools? Um, there was a study group done with two uh, uh, classes. One group of students that had not been exposed to firearms, another group of students that had been educated on firearms. They took those two control groups, they put a pistol unloaded in each and observed what happened. The kids that were not educated on the guns immediately gravitated to the gun, picked it up, started playing with it, pointing at other people. The kids that were educated immediately saw an adult, looked for a teacher. I, if I could, I'd like to just ask a question about, oh, about that. So last night we had really two kinds of testimony on uh, people talking about how to keep their guns in their home. So there were, there were half the people, it seemed to me, who said, of course, I always keep my guns locked up. I have kids. I wouldn't respect somebody who didn't keep their guns locked up, but I don't think the government should, should tell me to do it. We're already doing it. And I, I appreciate that and, and those kinds of people, um, and, I, and I believe them. There was another kind of person who said, I have a loaded gun uh, on my bedside table, but I've taught my kids never to play with it. And I, there's a certain kind of person who goes out with their dog and they tell themselves, I don't need a leash, even though there's a leash law, because my dog's very well behaved, until the dog bites somebody. In this case, what, what do you and your organization think should happen if somebody believes that and then their kid does pick up the gun and kill himself, or does pick up the gun and accidentally shoot their brother? Is there any responsibility on the part of the adult? And this gets back to Senator Sears' question about civil responsibility. I think if my kid was playing at that house and the child grabbed that parent's gun and killed my kid, I think I could sue them and I could win that case. Question being, shouldn't there be some kind of stronger prohibition <coughs> against leaving a loaded gun uh, to be picked up by him? Turning that situation around, Senator, yeah. um, a parent who uh, leaves a firearm out and doesn't educate a child, and their child then does something horrendous, possibly even uh, shooting themselves, would we really prosecute the parent? Would we really well, hold that parent accountable when they're going to be under such horrendous feelings? Uh, no, no, I, I, I get that, but my, my point is um, we require, if you have a swimming pool, we require that you build a fence around it. 
because it's called an attractive nuisance in law. In other words, children are drawn to pools, and they will fall in and some of them will die. So we say, on your property, inside your boundaries, you have to have a pool because you have an attractive nuisance. Yes, yes. And, and uh, in terms of guns, in our society, with what kids see on TV, there's nothing more attractive to them than a gun. And so my question is, and, and this goes to safe, safe storage, what, what is your group's position on, it seemed to me that there were many, many people that you would consider your members who honestly believe guns should be locked up. If that's the case, then what should happen with people who refuse to lock up their guns whose kids kill other kids or, or themselves? Uh, I'm not sure the uh, S-22 makes any provision for households who specifically have children. I raised my child. Yeah. I, I live alone. Um, this law affects me and others like me, even with grown kids, even with 23-year-old adults. Would you support it if it was limited households? Um, I think this is an educational situation, and for every situation you can describe where there's the possibility of something horrendous happening, I can look at this and say, where do we balance the constitutional right of self-defense? And I look at this as an educational issue. Um, I, I think it's very tragic, and frankly, the school shootings are not even really appropriate to this discussion, I don't believe. Um, but um, my well, brother lived under 55. the... Well, my brother, I believe, lived under the uh, nuclear threat where it was ducking cover. And that was not an acceptable situation. That was just what was had to be done in schools at that time. Um, if we address education in our schools, if we address the, the issue of suicide and the causing of what causes that, um, I think it's a much better bang for a buck. Um, we, we initiated the Vermont Gunshot Project after a successful iteration of that um, in New Hampshire. Um, we did that all volunteer. Where, where is this state? Uh, this, this came from money that, that the Department of Mental Health took from somewhere else so that we could do this public campaign. Um, the safe storage, uh, I think it, it is, it is well-intentioned. I understand where you're coming from, and, and if we can save that one, that one person, but I, I weigh very heavily. Uh, the ability of you, of, of everybody in this room, the sanctity of life and their ability to preserve their own life. Uh, I look at this and say education. Um, as far as pools go, uh, I think we would look if a household had a pool, there's probably more likelihood of someone drowning than a house that doesn't have a pool. And I look to say, isn't that the same argument as a gun? If you have a household with a gun in it, there is probably statistically a, a higher probability that that gun may cause a problem, similar to the pool. But it's an education. Uh, certainly, I would certainly think if, if parents aren't educating their children about firearms, there's firearms in the house, that's a recipe for a disaster. So why don't we turn this around and say the problem is education? We should be enforcing education on this real issue. And that should be in schools, so we can make awareness of this. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that uh, trying to pass a law about the sanctity of what I need to do in my home when I don't have uh, my, my son is, is was born in '81. He's a, he's a young man and out of my house. Um, so it's really just me now. But yet, there's no provision for for just adults in the house. This is a fairly broad sweeping bill. There could be. Huh? And, uh, and to, the, to the point on education, I would just say that we, we don't need to operate in, in exclusion of other venues. For instance, with the opioid epidemic, we pursue 20 new lines of attack against that epidemic every year, some are educational and some are otherwise. So in this case, I agree with you very much, education would help. Well, I, I just think that the two could work in a constant way. Uh, Joe, the final question. Thank you very much. This is not a question, this is a punctuation point. Eric, there is a statute called cruelty to a child or cruelty to a minor child. Could you pull that up for the community's benefit? Yeah. So you can get copies during the breaks. Uh -huh. 
Chris, thank you so much. I very much appreciate it for the opportunity. Thank you very much. And uh, your testimony. I assume it's been up for you updated a little bit. Yes, I did. And uh, um, thank the you. The next time. witness is uh, thank you. Carrie Lashes Summers. I'm going to do my best to get through all the witnesses. Um, so if you, may, if you need to take a break, please do so while you're going to. I'm not going to take a break today. Otherwise, we, we need to finish the testimony on this today so we have time to mark up about 15 other buildings. Well, maybe not 15, but several of them. Just hand it up. Morning. I'm going to do my best not to cry in front of you this year. <laughs> Chair Sears and the members of the committee, my name is Clay Blasher Summers and I'm the Executive Director of Fun Sense Vermont. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Gun Sense Vermont is a growing coalition of concerned citizens, gun owners, non-gun owners, Democrats, Republicans, progressives, independents, and more who understand that there's no other threat to public safety in the United States that looms as large as gun violence. Gun Sense Vermont advocate, advocates for gun safety legislation and other measures that will help guns out of the hands of people who should not have them. On behalf of Gun Sense Vermont, I'm here today to urge the committee to, to support Senate Bill 22. Waiting periods help reduce the occurrence of suicides and other impulsive acts of violence. Firearm suicide makes up the majority of gun deaths each year. Half of all suicides in the U.S. are carried out with a firearm. In 2017, Vermont's firearm suicide rate was 1.5 times higher than the national northeastern states. When compared to other means of attempting suicide, guns are by far the most lethal. Most people who attempt suicide do not die unless they use a gun. Across all suicide attempts not involving a firearm, less than 5% will result in death. But for gun suicides, those statistics are flipped. Approximately 85% of gun suicide attempts end in death. This fact is incredibly important because the vast majority of all those who survive a suicide attempt go on to live out their lives and do not subsequently die by suicide. A reduction in suicide attempts by firearm would result in an overall decline in the suicide rate. It is often said that suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Waiting periods may help prevent firearm suicides by delaying access to firearms. In delaying the immediate access to a firearm, waiting periods insert a buffer between impulse and action and are essential in providing that time. Time for someone to rethink what they are about to do time for them to reach out to someone and get help. Time that every parent who has lost a child to suicide wishes they had been given. Time for a parent or family member to notice the signs. Time for law enforcement to complete a thorough background check. Studies show that policies that create this buffer are associated with reduced rates of firearm suicide. According to Giffords Law Center, states with waiting period laws for gun purchases have lower rates of suicide. Research published in the American Journal of Public Health showed that states with waiting period laws have 51% fewer firearm suicides and a 27% lower overall suicide rate than states without such laws. When South Dakota repealed its 48-hour waiting period for handgun purchases in 2009, Overall suicides the following year increased by 7.6%. I'm here today to ask you all to support Senate Bill 52, uh, Senate Bill 22. Waiting periods are overwhelmingly supported by the public and effective in reducing gun violence and the incidence of suicide and attempted suicide by firearm. I'm grateful to, that today in Vermont we have the opportunity to pass life-saving legislation 
there's a few things that I did not put in here, um, but I just wanted to say, um, obviously we are in support of Senate Bill 72. Um, I think that that bill has made a huge difference in the state of Vermont. Um, and in terms of, I did not want to address in my testimony, but I will say I just forward, forwarded Eric um, uh, a chart of all the states that have safe storage laws. Um, and I just, I just always think about safe storage because I have personal experience <laughs> with, um, you know, with the case where there was a firearm left um, and a child picked it up and shot another child and that family will never be the same. The increase in children um, gaining access to firearms because they're not secure is rising in this country and I can, you know, uh, um, you know, submit submit the work that's been done around that. But thank you for <coughs> letting me testify. Thank you. Yeah, good. Call you there any questions? Yeah, please. I spent a lot of time last year listening to you and Karen Cookson and Amber Larson about domestic violence situations. And as a charter member of the Caledonia County Task Force on Domestic Violence, I'm very familiar with what goes on in domestic situations. We heard repeatedly last year that the most dangerous times in a domestic violence victim's life were five days immediately following their separation. It seems to me, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that both a safe storage and a mandatory waiting period are obstacles placed in the path of a domestic violence victim who would otherwise choose to get the most self-protective device I can imagine. Am I wrong in my assumption? You're wrong. Um, I can give you a look at studies that I don't have right here. And um, in households where there is um, domestic violence, the, uh, the rate of incidents where, okay, I have to back up because I was not prepared to talk about this. We, the Vermont Network, did submit testimony last night that to Senator Sears and to the committee. I will tell you this. I'll use a person, I will use a story first and then tell you in the best way I can without all my statistics what I know to be true. The woman who was, and I think this is a good example, the woman who was the head, um, I don't know, this is not really in my world, but she was the um, highest level uh, woman fighter, boxer, um, in this country, um, she was from Florida. She had um, a weapon, and her husband manager um, and she were getting a divorce, and he got her weapon, which was readily accessible, and shot her. I know of three other cases where that has been the case. Women are shot, not because they don't have, you know, when there's a gun present in that house, that is, it's like 55% times higher that the woman is shot. It's not a matter of um, anything else. So I, I, I've heard that argument before. Um, it's been used many times by the National Rifle Association, and I don't think the statistics bear that out. But I would be happy to send you some studies. Were you present last night? Yes, I was Did present. Did you hear the woman who was at the video? Yes, I heard her. Do you dismiss her? I don't dismiss her pain, I don't dismiss her fear, and I don't dismiss what she thought to be true. What I know to be true is that um, 
the rate of women grabbing a gun to shoot their domestic abuser are very low, very, very low. Most of the time, the gun is used against women. And that's just the case of it. And, and many times, it's used against the children that are standing next to the woman. And I have tried very hard in this committee not to bring up stories of people across this country that that, that, that has happened to. It's very personal to me. And it is, I will never dismiss another person's fear. But I also know that in national discussions, this has come up time and time and time again. And if we want to line up the women who guns have been used against them, and line up the women you know, who want that gun, the proof is in the women who have been shot and their children. Uh, you, you referenced the, the what you guys call the talking point that um, we really need we really need to preserve women's access to guns to defend themselves. But I, I think the hallmark of these kinds of arguments is that when they surface in the wake of a shooting, the solution is to give more guns to people in schools. In this case, in terms of domestic violence, the solution is to give more guns to women. Bottom denominator being the solution is always more guns for a certain kind of person making the argument. So I, my understanding matches your own. Everything I've ever read is that if there is a gun in a situation, regardless of who owns the gun, it will be used on the woman uh, in a domestic violence situation. Very, very rarely the other thing. I, I just, thank you, please. Um, I just wondered in Vermont, not nationally, but in Vermont of suicides, how, how uh, by firearm, how many of them were first time gun owners who just went and purchased a gun immediately to commit the suicide? And how many of them were either had access to guns someplace else or stole them or whatever? I don't think we have that information. I mean, I think one of the things that happened has happened across the country and in Vermont is that we, you, you may have assumptions, and now that there can be more research done, and I think that that is going to happen because the CDC can now do research even though they don't have research. Often the way that, that um, a death is recorded won't have all that information. I, statistics are very hard to follow. And I try very hard to understand. It seems that each side has statistics to offer to bolster their case. And they believe strongly in their case, and they believe strongly in their statistics. Um, there is one. Ultimately, if I might, ultimately, you may comment as you wish. Ultimately, it comes down to if you believe that a waiting period, a safe story, or something of that nature would help to prevent unintentional injuries. Suicides, and then you have to believe that this, that the suicides are not a planned event, but they're an impulsive decision that somebody makes, and in many cases, you know, they go, may not carry through with their threat, but with a firearm, <coughs> to play in them, it's much more lethal than, than perhaps the, <coughs> taking a lot of pills and somebody comes and they don't die from the pills and get the covers. So I think those are the types of, unfortunately, the statistics don't help us. So I, I, I think it's whether or not you believe that you would reduce the number of suicides because of mainly an impulsive act and 
not a planned act. I do believe that, and I believe it's the lethality of the gun. So I do believe that. And, um, you know, I have seen that happen in other families. Um, so I do believe that. Or, and that's what I've been trying to testify to. I didn't touch what the... Right, that's right. I think we try to find statistics. It's really difficult. I think there are certainly... Uh, I, you know, one of the arguments made at the public hearing last night that really hit home to me was the idea that if this had to do more with safe storage, I can't I can't get them caught in a few minutes. Well my god, if you live in Reedsburg, Vermont, you're not gonna get a cop for an hour. If they happen to be unless they happen to be right there in Reedsboro, because Reedsboro is over a mountain that's next to Massachusetts, the barracks in Shaftesbury. Uh, generally takes 45 minutes to an hour. I remember a guy he called me and said, I'm out there with a baseball bat trying to scare off some kids. I said, well, that was pretty stupid. Um, you know, why don't you go inside and, and wait? But, you know, it was over 45 minutes before the police arrived. So um, I understand that, particularly in rural areas where the access to law enforcement is <coughs> uh, um, can be. They talk, last night a lot of the people who testified talked in terms of minutes, I'm talking in terms of hours in some cases. So, so I just have a, I know that statistics are used any way we want them to, but I was a little, um, one of the things that Chris said was that um, in the, I think it was the Harvard study that when they <coughs> looked at um, suicide, overall suicide rates that of suicide by firearms re was reduced by waiting periods, but the overall suicide rate wasn't reduced in those states. And you said that in South Dakota, the overall suicide rate went up or the suicide rate by firearms? Suicide by firearms. So the overall- I wouldn't have, yeah, I guess I didn't say that, but. So it was the suicide rate by firearms. It would be open, so we don't know if this overall suicide rate went up. Um, I can find out. <coughs> I think Wisconsin also repealed yeah. their waiting periods. Maybe it's statistics from there. I, I just believe in common sense policies. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Um, our next witness is Bill Smith, representing the National Shooting Can I ask you to play one more question? For Claire. For Claire. Pardon? I'm, I'm sorry, can I just ask you one more question? Sure. I'm so, sorry. Uh, no, it's okay. I just, because this has been bothering me. If a 48 hour waiting period would impact everybody, right? So it isn't just first time gun owners. So if you've already got 12 guns in your house, why would, you, why would there be a 48 hour waiting period for you to get another one? I mean, I'm just, that is something this committee will have to, that this is a, you know, I don't, all I know, okay, from where I sit, is if there is a person who, if that's for new gun purchases. Right, right, I get, I get for the right. new gun purchase because that might be an impulsive act. Right. But this this would affect everybody, not just new gun purchases. I mean, new new gun owners. Mm -hmm. So why would we make somebody who already has firearms wait 48 hours? Because that's not an impulsive buy. I think that is why, you know, you're asking a what if question, and I understand that. I really understand that. What I am talking about is um, you know when someone this this 48 hour waiting period is 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 done in a lot of places and just having a buffer gap of someone going to buy a, a gun to commit suicide I, get, right. I, I, I know I get that mm -hmm. but if I'm, if I've already got guns, I, I'm not trying to argue, but I'm just trying to put this together because we have to make the policy. 
Right. And so I, I think that's what I'm saying. I mean, I have um, what I know to be true and what I have seen. Um, and, you know, that's a question that I think the committee will have to wrestle with. I also, there's a, there's a man in Vermont that we have not brought in to testify. And he was, we, he almost came yesterday. Um, but he felt a lot of apprehension about doing that. Um, you know, he may testify at another time. He had guns, previous. Um, he went and bought another gun, tried to commit to take his life by gun, did not succeed, caused great physical damage to himself. So, you know, that might be a, a question that I would ask him. I think anything that you can do, anything that you can do that will prevent a tragedy by gun, no matter if it's one life, last night I heard one life was not worth it. And I'm here to disagree with that. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, committee and thank you, Mr. Chair, for the record. Um, and I've also submitted testimony electronically from Jake McGregan, who's the Director of Government Affairs of the National Shooting Sports Foundation. Uh, I am a licensed lobbyist in Vermont for the National Shooting Sports Foundation. I'm an attorney in Northfield as well. Um, and I know that time's a bit limited, but I, I uh, first of all, I'd like to give you some specific um, um, stories about, if you will, safe storage and, and suicide, which um, I've had direct experience in. Um, I think that the, the articulateness of Chris Bradley and um, and the emotion of of the other speakers here today is something that you need to balance out. And the information provided by both sides is very important to this discussion. Um, uh, although I I uh, I'm going to ask your indulgence a bit because this is very personal to me as well as I know it is for many other witnesses you have on this issue. Um, I have, uh, uh, I don't have my usual well-organized stuff for you today because of that. It's, uh, it's hard when your professional life gets involved with something you feel passionately about. I think people on both sides of this issue can, can relate to that. Um, and I would say that I've experienced firearms used to protect a family and I've experienced a close family member's choice to end their life with a firearm. And um, um, I grew up in Plainfield in a family of dairy farmers and stone cutters that have been here, as they used to say, since Christ was a corporal. And uh, um, sort of the, the bedrock folks that uh, Bernie Sanders actually told me were the soul to the earth people he was honored to represent in Washington. And I, I believe him in that. Um, but growing up in Plainfield was kind of a microcosm for uh, this issue in a, in, and for the way our state has evolved today. Um, there were a lot of um, old time Vermont Yankees there and there were new folks coming into Goddard College. And um, it was uh, Berkeley East was what it was called in the early 70s if I recall correctly. Um, so you had the farmers and the hippies and um, it, it was a good way, place to grow up, but there was also this, uh, this edge of political tension and that was not always pleasant. Um, and coming to it from the farmer side of the equation, I, I typically had one view of it. I have the more, more tolerant view of things now, I think, as I've grown up to see both sides of it. Um, and the reason I'm sharing this with you is that when I was a little boy, my father and mother would take us on Sunday drives to go for picnics. And at that time, you could drive up into Hubbard Park and have a picnic there and climb the tower right up the hill behind the building. And we did that. And one day, we were driving out. You could drive down the dirt path down to Elm Street. And uh, I was maybe six years old, but this is one of the 
the events of my life that I remember as vividly as if it happened yesterday. Um, as we drove down around a corner into, a, into a, an open area in the woods, uh, there was a big rock across the road in front that blocking the path of the vehicle, a big rock. Um, and there was a group of people having a party out there in the woods. And that's fine. And my father, came, we came down the hill, and I remember my father said an expletive uh, <laughs> because he saw something that concerned him. And uh, about 25 folks dressed in colorful garb and uh, with long flowing hair, both men and women, obviously very different from my family and from my father with his crew cut and his uh, um, military background and, and dairy farming background. Uh, we drove down that hill and all of a sudden this group of people were all around the car. And I was in the seat right behind my father. And a, a man, my father had his window down and, he, and this man came up to the window and sort of was inviting us to join their party. And um, as he leaned in closer to talk to my father, my father pulled out a pistol and literally put the front side of it right up this man's nose and told him to have his people move the rock and get out of the way. And um, the man complied with that and the look of terror on his face uh, was, he knew what the situation was going to happen. So everyone moved the rock and we drove out, we drove out of there. And my mother said to my father, I didn't know you had a pistol in the car. And my father said, better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. And my perspective as a father, back on that these many, many years later, is that I'm glad my father had the training and the experience and the skill to get all of us out of that potentially deadly situation, including the man who came up to the window and to not hurt him either. Now, there's not many people in my experience who would have that training and experience and skill in that moment of extreme stress. But I raise the issue with you to say, there's an the experience of a firearm taken out of what was undoubtedly unsafe storage to protect his family. Um, Growing up in Plainfield, my grandmother was a Democrat. You, some of you may be surprised to learn that. Um, she was also the town moderator. And one day she said, you gotta meet this guy, he's coming to the Plainfield 4th of July parade. And sure enough, this young guy jumps up on her porch to meet her, sleeves rolled up, energetic. Uh, it's a doctor from up in Shelburne. And she goes, she introduced himself to her, she goes, he's gonna go far and watch him. And of course, with Dr. Howard Dean. Um, what she also told me was that new folks in town were Vermonters too. And we all have different perspectives on it. We've got to be tolerant of each other. And that's something that maybe in this, part, this debate in particular is very much red state, blue state, green shirt, orange shirt, pick your color, you're one side or the other. And we've got to get beyond that in Vermont. And this is a committee where you can get beyond that. Because those hippies I, that I grew up with in Plainsville, um, I married one of them. Sociologist tells me that's unique. But that just never happened. You, you partied together, but nobody ever got together and got married and had kids. And, um, uh, but I think that my grandmother's uh, tolerant view and the tolerant view of, of the people that were here before, uh, the farmers, if you will, were shorthanded, is historically based on the tolerance that we have in Vermont. It's a, a libertarian view, the values of those farmers and stonecutters that fought in the Civil War, that fought in the battle with the bulls like my dad, um, and the Cold War like my dad, and George Aiken, Dean Davis. Those are the kind of folks that made, it this, made this a different place. Now, the second part of this story is that um, on July 6, 2003, 
two police officers came to my door at nine o'clock on that Sunday morning to inform me and my wife that her brother was dead. And he had shot himself in Cabot, Vermont at his apartment. And I, I feel for the family of Andrew Black. I, I know what they were feeling to some degree. I'm not, I was not his parent, I was his brother-in-law. But uh, um, it didn't have to happen, um, but it did. And I would say the same thing to them as I said to my mother-in-law at the time. She said, no, when I gave his eulogy in the same church where he walked my wife down the aisle to me. He said, no parent should have to bury their child. And his experience in life was different than Andrew Black's. Um, he uh, took a wrong path, hurt family members, um, still loved him. And his choice to end his life was something that, in retrospect, could have seen it coming. Risk taking behavior, jumping a, in the in the cliff jumping at quarries at a, from 100 feet, riding his motorcycle 160 miles an hour in the interstate, um, shooting heroin in his veins. There were terrible things that were going on. Cry for help that none of us needed. Why didn't we heed the, the cry for help? Because he wouldn't accept our help. I offered it to him. But when I bailed him out, prison in New York State down in Westchester County for the second time. I didn't know how to help him. And I mentioned his case to this committee about 10 or 12 years ago in the context of the heroin epidemic. And it still continues today. And, it's, and that makes me think that we haven't solved that epidemic by legislative action. We've taken some good steps on in this committee. I know this committee to work on that. But it's very similar in this case to the suicide. <coughs> what, what legislatively can we do? And I guess I'd say that we all have these experiences and um, the, the echoes of a suicide in the family continue. Every time I go up Route 215 in the cabin, I stop at his grave and I ask him why. And for every time I go, I don't get an answer. <laughs> you know? But I don't I don't think um, I don't I guess I'm here in a way to kind of make sure we all humanize both sides of this discussion. Um, I choose to lock up my firearms. I have four teenagers in the household and, and, and we're blessed in that they have lots of friends that are over. Um, I love them all dearly, but I don't trust them. <laughs> I'm not saying that in a mean way. I'm just saying, like, you know, I have responsibility to them. I lock them up, but I also have, the, I'm blessed with the financial wherewithal to afford a gun safe and a fancy fingerprint access lockbox um, and things like that. And and I understand that. Well, my kids know the rules, and they grew up on farms and no safeties. I don't. Maybe their friends don't. Maybe their friends can't wait to go steal Mr. Smith's firearm to sell it for drugs. I don't know. But that's my choice to, to do that. And that's, I understand where Senator Baruch was talking about those tough cases that are out there that, that are about safe storage. And, and uh, it's, these are hard cases. and. The old adage in law is hard cases make bad law. And if you rush into stuff, particularly in this, um, we need to heal people, bring them back together. What happened with S55 last year at the end of the session was, was, was tough on folks. Um, uh, um, it's created a situation where there's, there's lack of trust on one side of the aisle. Um, um, but if you get, um, you know, our, our my concern is that if you get a bill out of this committee, the 
chairman talked about earlier, there's no saying what's going to happen with it on the floor or in the house or coming back over. Um, those farmers that in, in Plainfield, well, there aren't things, they don't run the show anymore. It's the, it's the hippies that run the show in Plainfield. And, and that's fine. You know, that's politics change. Um, <coughs> um, so what can we do? Well, Suicide is it's you know it's, it's it's a sad it's a real issue in our in our state. So is so is safe storage of farms. You know waiting periods are they going to work? Um, we have the, the drugs are on the rise. Um, when that postscript to the issue of my brother on suicide, that was a significant event that led to my divorce from his sister. I'm not going to get into specifics of that with you, but these things shatter families in, in ways that you can't recover from and. Um, the risk of having your home robbed and your guns taken is real. Firearm owners know that. We've got ways to work on that that don't require legislative action. Um, home invasions are on the increase in the state. If you think they're not, I would just give you the advice I was given by um, the chief of police where in the town where my now ex-wife was living with our, our daughters and I said I'm concerned that there's a specific individual who wants to do her harm. Um, and what do we do if we find out he's there? He's, and the chief of police said, does she own a gun? And I said, no, I said, maybe she had a gun. And, and um, she chose not to, and that's fine, you know. But she was at risk, my daughters are at risk from somebody that would be no compunction of going into their home and doing whatever it felt like. Um, conversation that we need to have is one about suicide prevention. Let's have it. But it does need to be an open and an honest conversation. And I think you, you know, some of the other folks have touched on the concern that, um, that this might be just one more, one more step in the, in the greater gun control debate. I say let's take it out of a debate on gun control and let's talk about suicide prevention. However, it happens. Chris Bradley was uh, knows the facts and figures in a way that I never can, and I would defer to him on that, and and see him as a, a as someone that can take part in these debates as well and, and should be listened to. Um, um, trust at, uh, that trust needs to be rebuilt after S fifty five. Um, I'm willing to do what it takes to do that, and I think we all need to reach across the aisle. Like my grandmother said, you know, you know, we're all Vermonters, and let's try to figure that, figure this out in the Vermont way, not in a way that comes to you from um, national groups, even the National Shooting Sports Centers, in a way that works in Vermont. These groups will be part of that discussion, and we'll all be at the table. But it's bigger than that, and it it deserves more measured more measured response from this. And I look to this committee to be the leader. In this. Because for so many years on these issues, you have been. And Mr. Chairman, I thank you for that on these issues of um, you know, drug use, firearm abuse. Um, otherwise, we're just going to constantly have the next bill and the next bill and the next bill on and make it all about gun control, gun control, gun control. And you're never going to get people together to solve the problem work on the problem of reducing the amount of young people in our state, in particular, who choose to end their life. Um, um, you must, we've got to all reach across the aisle to create a greater Vermont Day solution on that. Um, because I'm concerned that the people I grew up with, the people that I that agree with the company, I, the federation, the foundation I represent, the gun folks, are pretty skittish about the political process in this building. If we could just slow this down and talk about it in suicide, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, I thank you for your time today. Um, I, the letter from Jacob Wigan does specifically look at um, 
issues of data storage and, and um, waiting periods. Um, I would say this, that all newly, new firearms are sold with a locking device provided with them, which if used is a correct, is an effective means of, of addressing issues of unauthorized access to that firearm. Um, thank you for your time. And I apologize if I've gone on too long. Or gone too personal. Very helpful and a reminder that, you know, in my opinion, uh, the two issues that the legislature has failed to adequately address in the last, uh, not only in this administration, but only in the last administration, this administration, and this legislature. I haven't really focused on the heroin epidemic to the level that we should. And I don't think we're focused on the mental health problem that we should, should, should be right now. Hopefully, uh, the bill that just came out of the Health and Welfare Committee um, to take a look at the treatment and so forth for uh, drug addiction would be a start. Uh, and uh, we can have a conversation about, particularly in rural areas of the state. I know Chittenden County uh, was uh, very happy kind of reduces the number of drug overdoses. But the number of drug overdoses in the rest of the state has risen. Um, and part of that is because of resources that aren't available. And I thank you for your reminder about that. And I thank you for your reminder about the level of the mental health care. And we, we had 54 beds at the time Hurricane I replaced those beds and they're being used in the emergency rooms. And, you know, the, the, Institutions Committee, the Health and Welfare Committee, and the Appropriations Committee are all working to try to restore some sanity to the system that we have that's broken. Um, yeah. And that's true of most states, but we, we are particularly, and, I, and that's one thing that I, I appreciate your reminder of those two issues. So thank you. Well, they work hand in hand, and it, it, they do overlap a lot. And whether we pass this bill or don't pass this bill, those two issues are out there and need to be addressed. <coughs> anyway, um, if we could get on to the next witness. Thank you. Running, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next witness is Devin Craig, the former president of the Very Fish and Game Club. Good morning. Good morning. I guess I'll be in a speed reading again, but. <laughs> You all remember, I'm sure it's firmly embedded in your mind, I only got through half of what I had to say last night, but I'll try to be brief. Just to reiterate, the Fish and Game Club and other clubs and communities in Vermont are going to lose a bunch of revenue. Now, that's an unintended consequence, but it's as a result of the 48-hour waiting period. Uh, it's, it's a reality. Now, the gun culture in Vermont is real. It's tradition. 99% of the gun usage in Vermont, I firmly believe, is illegal and without any consequences. But it was said before, what, what is a life worth? Is a life worth dollars and cents? It's actually priceless. What's worth, something's worth to one person is not worth to another. But how do we prevent liberties being taken because we want to save one life? That's something that we all struggle with, we're all going to have to struggle with. It's very tough to feel that you're going to solve the world's problems by passing a law that's very tentative on its results. Anyhow, I'll read the second part of what I said. <clears throat> Excuse me. The second part of S-22 would require all firearms to be locked up in households. Not only is this highly unenforceable, it severely hampers the natural right of a person to be able to defend themselves, especially in rural Vermont, where law enforcement is usually many, many minutes away. We believe S-22 is nothing but an opportunist, opportunistic effort on the part of anti-gun people to continue their own prejudice assault on law-abiding gun owners. We believe that laws of Vermont should be made using common sense and pragmatic reasoning, 
They should not be made in reaction to aberrant behavior. Suicides are not normal. You're never going to stop them. They're going to happen. Unfortunately, I know I lost my brother and my father. Laws should be made for the common good of all citizens of Vermont, not just a select few, all of them. You know, there's a lot of statistics out there, used both ways, and minoring in statistics in college, I know what you can do with a group of figures. You can do anything you want with them. But if we look at pragmatic reasoning, you're not gonna stop suicides. You might make a small, tiny dent in them, but it's not going to happen based on the law. The other unintended consequence of uh, gun shows, for instance, being will be eliminated is the fact that it's actually a form of public speech. Groups of people all throughout the state get together and talk about new things, old things, hunting, fishing, all kinds of stuff. And that's going to go away. That's part of the Vermont culture is that we're a big family. I live in Plainfield, Vermont. It's kind of a disruptive family, but we mostly get along. The gentleman before me was talking. We don't all have the same ideas, but we need to get along and we need to preserve the culture of this state. You know, there's a slow chipping away of our rights. Are we going to become such a homogenized society that individualism is lost? Are we going to come to the point where there's a law for breathing? We need to use common sense and say, I empathize with the blacks. I empathize with the dead and cranks. But do we need to have laws to prevent human adult behavior? This is, my, my father and my brother made a choice. It was a wrong choice. We don't get to interview them after they're dead. We don't know what goes through their minds. Maybe they leave a letter, maybe they don't. But that's something that we will never be able to prevent. One or two maybe, but on a large scale, it's not gonna happen. There's too many ways to do it out there. A bridge, drugs, anything like that can be used. If you can't get a gun, I'll tell you what, my brother and my father would have done it some other way. It was part of their lives with alcoholism, bipolar disorder, stuff like that. It's a health issue in the state of Vermont. That's where we need to go. You want to make a dent? You start making a dent with health issues, support groups, things like that. That's where our tax money should go. I could expound forever, but I won't. But I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we, uh, that concludes the <coughs> testimony on S seventy, uh, S twenty two, and one two three, and uh, one two and thirteen. Um, you want to take a five minute break? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then we'll pick up on S72. Uh, and uh, I'm going to get two of the witnesses are by phone, and I don't think Judge Harrison's not here right now. So maybe we can. We're, we're going to just take a five minute break. <laughs> And I'll speak only to that portion of the bill that relates to um, the request to the judiciary, which is under uh, section, section 2, Annual Reporting Office of Court Administrator and yep. Agency. Uh, on page 3, uh, it gets specific beginning on line 3 as to what's 
requested or required from the court, we can certainly comply with number one and number two, and we track that data anyway. The number of extreme risk protection orders filed, the number issued, the number denied, uh, the number extended, whatever data you want on the history of a, a order, the, and as well as number two, the geographical data indicating the county where the petition was filed. Number three, uh, follow-up information. We just would not have access to that information at all. In other words, uh, once, it, once the order is issued as to whether or not the individual receives treatment, uh, how long, whether they receive treatment or not, we would not have access to that information, and it would not uh, it would not be any information contained in our files. Basically, the only way we would hear from the case again is if someone requested an extension of the uh, order. Two. So one and two, we can comply with completely. Three, we just don't have any of that information, and would not have it even under our new case management system. You, but you are tracking this. We do. We do. I think a number a. Yes. Well, you would know if they if we reworded three to provide information where an order was either dismissed or extended. As I remember, there are a six-month order. The first is a six. It, there's the, the first step, the second step, and the third step would be a reissue. Exactly. So, so we can we can wait. Maybe if we were more specific in th in three, Eric. Yeah. To the information that the court would have on whether or not the order was you know continued after the six. Am I remembering? 60 days, and then after six months, if it was either um, you know, renewed or... Renewed, I think, is it? Yeah. Renewed. Uh, certainly, we would track that information. <coughs> that would be the information, maybe in three, instead of describing the follow-up information, but information on the, what happens. And it really could be an extension of... Uh, Section one, number of orders filed, yeah. number of orders issued, and the number um, extended. Uh, that, that information we would have. Good. Anything else? No, the rest of the bill, as I saw, obviously it relates to uh, health. Uh, health. Senators, so, I think you were wondering this morning on, on a separate issue, uh, that Judge Pearson might, might know off the top of his head, which is compliance with the statute you passed a few years ago regarding the reporting for right. the uh, National Institute Criminal Background Check System of oh, when the court has found someone in danger themselves or others. Remember, there was that statute passed that required reporting. Man, everyone that goes into the custody of the yeah. Department of Criminal right. Health has to be reported. I mean, exactly. I don't have the numbers. If you're interested in the numbers, I can get those for you. Are, but we, certainly reporting? We're, Are we reporting? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. yes. There seems to be some misinformation out there. Whether we are or aren't. Well, we're reporting it as we're required to do, whether it's being properly, in other words, we don't submit it to the ultimate registry. We submit it through, I believe it's through VCIC, and then they forward it on. But we're doing Maybe our we piece. Check for Jeffrey. Yeah. We'll see that would be the next step. I think it's also a misunderstanding that some people think that I everybody think that, with yeah, mental health issues uh, should be reported. We, you just know, has to be in custody. Right, right. We know. Oh, and uh, we were very, <coughs> trying to be very careful to respect yeah. the rights of persons to possess firearms. So we made a requirement of a court order to be there. Um, and so there may be some confusion of that. People who are, you know, we didn't want to dissuade somebody from seeking a counselor. It doesn't mean that they're mentally ill, but they're in mental health treatment. They could. My recollection was that they could be uh, under treatment for mental illness, but unless they're in the custody of the department, mental health, either hospitalization or non-hospitalization order. That, that was the, so, anyway. Okay. Uh, anything else? To Judge, thank you very much. And thank you for taking me out of order. I appreciate it. I think you were. Uh, I
question. We'll fall down to number three and I have to be elsewhere. Thank you very much.
because I think you could, there could be an argument that Vermont narrowed it. Um, you know, Act 51 talks about how generally there's no legal duty to seek to control the conduct of another to protect the third person from harm. And what it really calls out is a special relationship between two people, like a mental health professional and client or patient. And this definition is really broad um, because you're talking about um, just a healthcare provider, and it's a really broad definition. Um, and so I think there's a question about whether or not that special relationship is there. The other thing is that special relationship is based on the standards of the profession, um, and, and that's kind of giving the person the ability to make that determination. And your definition is so broad that, again, there could be a question about whether or not you, you have enough knowledge or what is the standard um, that you'd be looking at. One of the other things that um, S3 and 51 talked about that is one of the reasons for overturning Kulagowski was that it didn't have an identifiable victim. So if there was a lot of testimony about how difficult that would be to try to warn for just the public in general. And then the definition in your bill does talk about the person or the public. So you're lacking that identifiable. So those are kind of the bigger issues that I thought there could be questions. I understand that. Would a school be an identifiable? Would a, when we, uh, you know, if, if, the, if the healthcare provider had that the patient poses an extreme and imminent risk of causing harm to himself or other, would that include Middlebury High School? Um, well, when you're looking at, at Act 51, it talks about identifiable victims. So I think there was testimony about how a school would not be an identifiable victim necessarily. And I, so it's really fact specific, so it's hard to say. Um, there could be an instance, um, although I, I think you could make the argument either way. Um, okay. Uh, I just feel like if, if, the, the, if the healthcare provider believed that this person had considered shooting up, you know, and, and doing mass shooting at a high school in Vermont, like Middlebury, or, but didn't have a specific person, but either a group of students or a group of teachers. I, I thought in Kulagowski we put some language that it was an identifiable victim or victims, that somehow there was language, am I wrong, Karen, that we, I thought we put something in that, so that if, if the person said, I'm going to go shoot Dr. Jones, that was the identifiable victim, but if he said, I'm going to go shoot, um, everybody in the fifth grade that that i thought we made a provision for that that, that so that that was covered so it it just quotes directly from tech uh saying yeah. that health professional who knows or based upon the standards of the mental health profession should know that his or her patient poses a serious risk of danger to an identifiable victim has a duty to exercise reasonable care I remember those discussions, um, but the language also was just quoted from Pat. Right. word for word, it's verbatim. It's true that it doesn't include every piece of the HIPAA exemption, uh, but it's quoted from, uh, I think it's uh, uh, J1 of the HIPAA exemptions is where the, the language is uh, used to clarify the definition of necessary to prevent or lessen a serious and imminent threat to the health of public, health or safety of a person or the public. 
I think it was intentional to then tie that to the definition that's used in the extreme risk protection order statute. Any comment on that? Yeah, so I think as I, so I think the issue could be um, that the state law can be more restrictive than HIPAA. And so there could be an argument that by the case law in fact and then Act 51 that Vermont chose to make it more restrictive than HIPAA. And instead of having it be persons or public, they limited it to identifiable victims. I'm not saying whether that is or not, you know, I'm not necessarily taking a position on it. I'm just saying that that could be an issue. It could be argued that, that you made it more restrictive. Who would, who would make that argument? In other words, I, in other words, could a health care provider, I think the, the concept here of the health care provider being able to disclose this information in a situation implicated by ERPO was, was, proposed by a health care <coughs> provider. So that just makes me wonder, who, who would make the argument that you're talking about? Would it be challenged? Would a health care provider decline to make the disclosure because they thought it might be limited by Vermont law from doing so or by HIPAA? You know, who, who, would, who would raise that challenge is my question. Um, sure, I mean, well, a health care provider, because it's discretionary, they could choose not to. I think where you may come into an issue is if, you know, an advocacy group or a person who, you know, they reported on then makes the argument that that was, that, that was illegal, that they didn't have a right to disclose that protected health information. You know, I don't know if that would happen, but I think that, you know, that's where you, you might get the challenge if someone whose health information was disclosed. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. That, that helps understand, may not understand the issue. Should it be shall or should it be may? Um, your language? Yeah. Should, I mean, should, I think it, should, it, with should it give the uh, mental health or the health care provider the discretion, or should it be an automatic that you have? HIPAA is may. Well, HIPAA says may, so you can't, you'd have to track. Okay. Uh, well, I, I mean, I think you should use may. Um, of course, that's your decision, but it, it seems like that may be more uh, consistent. No, I did. Thank you, that's helpful. Other questions for Karen? Karen, thanks for reminding us of, of Kulikowski and some of the issues. And uh, thank you for your testimony, really appreciate it. You're more than welcome. Thank you for accommodating me and allowing me to do it telephonically. No, no problem. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye now. Thank you. Bye. Did, did that mean to put a, should it be, on line 13, should it be an extreme and imminent or imminent and extreme risk, or, or just leave it as is? Uh, well, we should probably want to track, yeah, the idea there was to track the language used in the under my verbal statute. So, on line the, 7, you use the term imminent threat. And then on line 13, you use it. Well, that's I guess my question. The series of imminent appears on line seven and line eleven. Okay. So the idea there is that you've, def you've taken the HIPAA language and defined it to include the ERPA language. Okay. So you, you, you're right. You have to use imminent in both places, but you got it in line yeah. seven. And line oh, but it's covered by line eleven. Exactly. The imminent. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Was she the right person? Yeah, Dr. Passardi now. Yeah. This poor guy's been waiting for him to talk to you guys. Well, I hope not. Not, not, not the guy. I mean, emergency. he was supposed to testify the last time. I hope he's still in the emergency room doing his job. Yes. Who is he? Who is he? He's a Bennington doctor. Sorry. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Also been very active. The other one, uh, uh, Chris, uh, Chris, Dr. Bassardi. So thank, thanks for taking time with us. This is Dick Sears, 
and you're with the Senate Judiciary Committee, and there are a number of witnesses here, including the court. Um, and we're taking up the bill that you recommended, um, S-72, uh, regarding the extreme risk protection orders. And it has two parts to the bill, as you know. One is to allow uh, a HIPAA exemption uh, for a physician who will, or a healthcare provider uh, who believes somebody may be an extreme risk themselves or others. And then the second is the reporting information. And maybe that's a good place to start since you're, the, uh, you're trying to work with a national group to get reporting on these extreme risk protection orders nationally. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to participate. Um, as, as an introduction for those who don't know me, um, I am an emergency physician at Southwest Vermont Medical Center in Bennington. Uh, I also work at Berkshire Medical Center in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Uh, I am the immediate past chair of the Trauma and Injury Prevention Section of the American College of Emergency Physicians. And I participate on two public health committees at the Massachusetts Medical Society, which is the publisher of the name of Journal of Medicine, the uh, Committees on uh, Preparedness, and the Committees on Violence Intervention and Prevention. Uh, and I'm testifying as a Vermont citizen and institution, and I do not uh, represent any organization in the testimony. Uh, regarding the, the data collection, we have some information uh, in the literature that the effect of uh, disorienting individuals at high risk to themselves or others does improve health outcomes. Uh, I submitted to your aid uh, last week uh, an article that uh, describes some preliminary data on a Connecticut law showing that uh, suicide rates can be decreased by um, disarming those who present uh, to be a risk to themselves or others. And what we'd like, what we hope to be able to accomplish by uh, having information on these cases is to identify the trajectory of risk that these individuals have so that we can better understand what constitutes high risk and more importantly, how do we walk people back to high risk once we've identified it. Uh, this is only possible if we are able to obtain good data. And we hope to be able to uh, demonstrate that the, the impact of this law on Vermont health outcomes. We have a very high rate of suicide per capita in the state. We're about 35% higher than the rest of the country. Um, and there are multiple reasons for this, but if we can decrease the uh, incidence of suicide, we will have a substantial impact on our, uh, our health outcomes and our health expenditures. Good, thank you. Are there any questions about the data collection? Are you concerned at all with the with the other section that uh, you also suggested, which is the uh, maybe you can give us a few comments about your ability to contact law enforcement? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we in, in practicing medicine we have obligations to individual health as well as the public health. And when we identify an individual whom we believe to be at serious or imminent threat, and that's the language of HIPAA, that the Health Insurance Portability um, and Accountability Act, this is what regulates patient confidentiality. We are allowed under that law to disclose patient information and warn people who may be at risk, um, but the threshold is serious and imminent. There, aren't great definitions, especially a priori or a definition in advance of what imminent means. And so it's very important for us to have a way to uh, notify the, uh, those who can mitigate a threat when we have a serious concern ourselves. Um, the penalties for disclosing patient information without their consent are substantial. Um, and nobody wants to go and stick their neck out to uh, make a declaration if that threshold is below imminent. And we don't have a good definition of imminent. And what this law does is it qualifies HIPAA and allows us to, like in other cases of public health, like identifying some special transmitted diseases or reporting tuberculosis or reporting child abuse, to identify in good faith this, that we believe that is an essential risk and therefore uh, intervene 
or not understand the need to mitigate that threat. But this is similar to your mandatory reporting requirements. If a child came in with a broken arm that you felt was the result of uh, a violent uh, act by someone else, is that correct? Right. Absolutely. And this is an example of how state law can qualify federal law. Um, and what's really important, and I appreciate much about this law, is that it does not mandate reporting by physicians uh, because we don't. If physicians are, are mandated to report anybody whom we believe to be at risk, then we're going to end up in a situation like the New York Safe Act that has very little um, impact on health outcomes and a substantial burden to both patients and physicians. So if we required you, may, if we dropped the bay, you'd have to report people that you didn't need to report. Is that? I believe so. Uh, what, what's the New York experience, Doctor? So the New York Safe Act came out, I want to say 2014 or 2013, and that in that law, all healthcare providers who perceived uh, a risk from their patients were mandated to report to the state uh, that person. And then the state had a process by which they uh, would identify the person and perhaps the it. And my understanding of the law and the result of that law over time is that only one to three percent of all the declarations resulted in the disarming of a dangerous person. Um, and there were thousands and thousands and thousands of declarations. I, I worked in New York State for a period of time and doing that, doing that paperwork and identifying those individuals was incredibly onerous, not just to physicians, but also to patients. And I think it's important for us if we're going to be going uh, to the point of making legislation that, that it should be informed by stakeholders like patients and physicians so that uh, the burden is diminished. That's really helpful. You have no idea how many people last night had shirts on. We had a public hearing last night with a no, do not New York my gun rights, and I guess that was one of the issues that um, was on the shirts. So the, the back of the shirt. I, I think it. I, I think it comes from it's like a, a good place that like we want to be able to, and what this law that you're proposing addresses that like we want to be able to help those people whom we believe to be at risk to themselves or others, and we want to do it in a selective, smart way that doesn't infringe on individual rights or impose on the physicians. Without disclosing anybody's identity, have you had situations where you felt you should be able to report law, to law enforcement but haven't been able to? Yes, I've had several of these cases in the month. Uh, and I, uh, I also want to bring your attention, there were two, uh, two articles from Vermont Digger that I submitted uh, last week. One that described that there are 43 threats to schools in Vermont last year, and the other one that described an alleged um, plot to harm students at, the, uh, at Middlebury. And what I want to, what is important to uh, articulate about these is that of those threats to schools, the police know about 43, whereas physicians and healthcare providers throughout Vermont may actually be seeing more of them. And I know that they are because I've seen these cases myself where we have a person whom we believe to be uh, a threat to themselves, but we don't have a way of ranking their risk. We don't know how to say, well, it's high risk, or it's imminent risk, or it's super high risk. We just don't have this kind of scoring system. But we identify a risk, and then we are charged to do something about that. Um, and the other one, the report from Billbury, describes how one of the alleged perpetrators was then brought to Porter Medical Center after the extreme risk protection order was um, was activated for mental health evaluation. And this is what happens commonly. When people are identified to be a risk themselves or others, they're brought to health care by family, by friends, social workers, and not just law enforcement. And we are sometimes the only individuals who have this information. And we have the ability to help these people, and we have the ability to help our communities by informing. Doctor, are there any other questions for Dr. Bassar? Uh, it, you've been extremely helpful today, Doctor. Are there any things that you'd like to add? Um, it, yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity. The, um, we, it, within a, in the United States and in Vermont, we, we don't have a public health 
approach to the problem of environmental justice. And one of the reasons that we don't have adequate research funding um, is hopeful that this will change uh, with the CDC or NIH, but also there are opportunities for private investment. Um, speaking to the point of data collection, once we actually have a plan of society to address this epidemic of gun violence, then the epidemic will be controlled like all the epidemics that we've had. So it's hopeful that through laws such as this one, that we will be able to generate data sets so that we can understand what risk is and identify those people who are at risk to themselves or others and help them to help themselves and to, and to save our society from unnecessary uh, suffering. I appreciate your one of the things you and I talked about privately, I guess, is the, is the fact that you are a, a gun owner. You're not, uh, you're not up to uh, end gun ownership. Absolutely. I, I am a gun owner. I, I train my kids how to use guns safely. It's a part of our culture. Thank you. 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 Hey, doctor, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for your patience and us getting to you. And uh, thank you for the information. And we'll see you back in Bennington soon, I hope. All right, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. He's really a good doctor, too, by the way. I've had occasion to visit him in the emergency room. I spent Monday night in the emergency room. Well, he, he's the one that took care of my shoulder. Told me I couldn't go on a cruise. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it was the Friday true. night. We were supposed to leave Saturday morning, and I went to the emergency room. So that's all that day. Oh, no. Luckily, I bought cruise insurance. <laughs> that was my first encounter with Dr. Mustard. He was not going to go on a cruise. It was a town meeting break. Anyhow, that concludes the testimony. And so, I, I'll tell you, I don't have any more. Mark this up. Thank you. We've got a number of bills here to, to discuss. Um, and uh, we want to begin. Judge Bruce has said they're already collect they already have this information and 
can we get the same result by not having a bill? I think you could, uh, except for the part, uh, part two of the bill you could. I don't think the first section could get that without some legislation that allows that to. Uh, one of the incidents that he, uh, that he and I talked about privately was where <coughs> technically he couldn't contact the police without somebody who was in danger an imminent risk to both himself and others who had a number of firearms and somehow um, you know, he couldn't contact one of them with another hit. Even, even, even with Kuligowski when we yeah. deal, dealt with that? Yeah. Why? I, I don't know why. I, well, I shouted that out. Yeah. I thought we did too. We, I, maybe, maybe we should have asked him why. Maybe we should have asked him yeah. why he felt they couldn't do that. Um, well, so maybe the, the, it sounded like the department felt the need was more direct. I, guess. I don't really care. I mean, we've got S1 that I haven't heard any opposition to. But that's the well, that would be, are you opposed? I, I have been uh, keeping my own counsel until we have a discussion of all the okay. bills together, but I, please don't take my silence as uh, all right. as support for Senator Rogers' bill. Right. I actually voted for S1 last year as an amendment on yeah. the floor. Which was an argument people made last night. But there's nothing wrong with 
having a loaded firearm on your bedside table. And if a state's attorney believed that, I don't believe they would charge somebody under this unless there was a specific provision that made it illegal to leave the firearm loaded. You see what I'm saying? No, no. because because what you're saying is if, if, if something happens to the child or if it endangers or his or her health or somebody, a child's his or her health, then, then, they're, then they can be prosecuted under this. No, they can. They can, yes. I'm, I'm saying that if, I believe many people might not, given the current state of our laws and the, the um, as we heard last night, there's a fairly common idea among gun owners that it should be okay to leave a, a loaded weapon where a child could get it. So a state's attorney might say, that's not neglect, that's not um, endangering a child, that's a tragic accident, and I'm not gonna prosecute them with this. Yeah, they might, and they might say the same thing. If well, there's a law that says you have to have it, no, car seats. Car seats are a big one. Well, I mean, if there's a law that says you, you can't leave your gun loaded where a kid can get it and you're at work and your kid finds your gun, then you're, you're liable. It's very similar to the car seat argument that has come up repeatedly in terms of there's a death in a car accident and the child is killed and the child is not, a very young child is not in the car seat as required by law. And the question is, is does the state's attorney charge them? Do they? I think it's been different all over. Rather than say your child, they usually. I, mean, I think of one case that said, hey, there's a tremendous loss here, I think your child is dead. There was a community commission that the community calls that will bring them any more than what's already being imposed on their life at that point. Right. You're seeing a growing number of cases where people are prosecuted for driving drunk and their children are being charged under yeah. this. Under this. Under this. Yeah. 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 There have been a number of those. Yeah. I'm, I'm just. And can, can I speak to the six more, please? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I thought Ruth was um, impassioned this morning. I thought she made a fine case. I, I have heard a lot of testimony this week that leads me to believe probably safe storage is not right to me. And I, I would be uh, willing to not make that piece of testimony too. I do believe we've heard compelling testimony about waiting periods, um, and I understand it's not uh, compelling testimony that doesn't have compelling opposition, because it does. But with that said, it seems to me that maybe the, the better focus for the committee is on waiting periods rather than safe storage, because I, I could see a, a series of votes where I would uh, vote for a bill that did not have safe storage in it. Um, the waiting period seems to me of those on the table the most is good. I'm not sure how I'm going to vote on waiting periods at this point, but I can tell you that my sense is that there is not support at this stage for a safe storage law. And a number of reasons have been brought up, so I, I appreciate your willingness to compromise. I thought Bill, I thought Bill Smith made a, a good, um, just at the very end, he threw out something that said um, maybe require every new gun purchase to be sold with a safety lock and in this, in, in the. I thought he said already did. They do? He's, he's oh, they, they do? Oh, I don't know what he said. He, he said something, of and it says, I'm telling you the price. I thought he said that we could get them. I think he them. said they already sell new weapons with With safety lock, and they're $10, so, okay. No, I, if they're I have a pistol that has a safety lock. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Are they all sold with safety locks? Okay. I think there's enough safety on all. I mean, there may be old weapons that don't have safety. Right. Would you like to comment, sir? Yeah, you're just, you're just talking, identify yourself. Right. Darren Goins with NRA. Yeah, you're, you're talking about two different issues. Senator Sears is referring to the safety on the firearm. Um, what you're asking about is a mechanism that is sold uh, with every handgun. There's a, it looks like a padlock. It's a cable lock. With a cable that goes through it and it fits through the, the breech. And okay. so it, it prevents the firearm from being fired. And every new handgun um, is provided with one of those. Okay, that, that's what I wondered. Picture up right there. Like yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's a picture. That's yeah. And it's in, it's in here, too. Yeah. yeah. Um, regarding waiting periods, uh, we had an email that everybody got, and I asked if he had made copies and put it as part of the record from a Dr. Cotton in Burlington. And Dr. Cotton talked about that a waiting period terms of reducing suicide would not be effective. I get it was his opinion, and I'm sure we can get other opinions, but I was struck by it because he talked about that most suicides are planned and not impulsive. And I don't know if you've read the email from Dr. Kaufman. Do you have, have you printed it out yet? I haven't printed it out yet. Yep. So that everybody has a copy of it. And it led me to wonder, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with impulsive acts. I think many of us, I mean, I impulsively was on my way back from Florida and was at West Palm Beach Airport. And there was a certain plane there that I found myself impulsively flipping a bird to. It was Air Force One, I believe. <laughs> I realized that there was a long way around that. You really wanted to get that in, didn't you? I did. I had okay. to get it out of the way. No, Trump is there. It's a big deal. Um, you need so, a trigger lock on your finger. I do, yes, I do. I may need that. But, you know, so I understand impulsive acts, but, you know, the letter made me wonder is it. Would a waiting period prevent gun violent suicides? We know that we've gotten information from the doctor, and I think it's clear that um, firearms are lethal if they're used in a suicide, maybe more successful than other means. So it, it got me wondering, I, I'm hoping to get information others about Dr. Coffin's life. Well, I would be curious about that. The, um, I mean, I know that, and I think Clay was going to check on the South Dakota thing about the, because we did hear that the um, number of suicides by, I think it was the Harvard study, the number of suicides by firearms decreased, but the number of overall suicides did not decrease. And so uh, I don't, I don't know what that tells me. It just tells me that, that it didn't decrease the number of suicides. They just found other and, and a number, methods. A number of states have put a waiting period but only on handguns, not on all firearms. Yeah, Wisconsin just repealed there, but I believe theirs was on just handguns. And I, Florida is just handguns, I believe. Um, I may be mistaken in Florida as well. <clears throat> and then there's a number of states with different um, time periods, from 10 days to 24 hours. And I think that the original, um, when I met with the blacks, and my understanding was they were requesting the 24 hour period. that, you know, they didn't see safe, you know, we've already dealt with safe storage, but they didn't see that as an issue that needed to be addressed. 
So I, I did ask the question about um, previous gun owners about <coughs> whether um, a 24 or a waiting period should apply to them. And I got a response that said that um, Andrew Black, the families where they um, have what they would consider a suicidal person in their family, usually take the guns away and lock them up. And that he, they had, I got the impression that they didn't know that he was at risk, that he, but the answer I got was that they had taken, he had hit, he had a gun and he had it locked up and he didn't have access to it, so he went and bought another one. <coughs> so had they, did they know that he was suicide? I mean, I. I don't think they did, but the point they made, um, that the father made was, his gun was locked up where he couldn't access it. And so he went, and, right. and that was an argument he made against the idea somehow that you could only affect first time buyers. So, so in other words. That Andrew himself had a gun yes. that was locked up, but yes. he couldn't access it? Correct. His exactly. gun? Correct. His parents had control of the gun and it was locked up in their safe. They, they had control of the key. Right. They, that was, they only use, Andrew and the father only used their guns for a shooting contest, at, or a shooting range target yeah. practice, yeah. that sort of thing. They were, I don't believe they were hunters. I believe they just yeah. were shooting. Yeah. They participated in the contest. But if I could just speak to the, uh, you know, John Rogers raised this possibility, and, uh, you know, if there were a way to do it, I, I would certainly consider it. I just don't see any way, practically speaking, in the real world, that you could limit a waiting period to people who don't already own a gun, unless you had a database of everyone who owns a gun in Vermont, which we do not, and which all of the groups we've heard today would fight the tooth and nail if we tried to start. So, you know, the fact that somebody might have bought a gun at the gun store last week or last year and the person knows them, you can't build a wall on that. Um, so it seems as though the, the question is, do you have a waiting period for every purchase of a firearm or don't you? Um, and I, I, I guess if people feel that it's too much of a hardship on people who already own guns, then they would vote against it for that reason. I just can't imagine a compromise where somehow you you target it to first time buyers because I I've thought about it a good amount. I just don't see a way to do that. Unless you had gun registration. Right. Which, you know, I'm John and I actually, if you had a Venn diagram of me and John, there is an overlap. And it's that both of us really don't like intrusive government action where it's not necessary. Um, so I, I don't want to database of gun owners either. I would, I would vote against that myself. Um, so that, that leaves me back where I started, which is I think a 48 hour waiting period would, um, we, we tend to have reduced it to just suicide, and certainly that's the focus, but a lot of states think of it as a cooling off period. So it's, it's not just that somebody might kill themselves, it's that they're angry, they don't have their gun with them, they go to buy a gun, to use on someone else. So it's not just suicide, it could be homicide. And the idea is that you, you allow some breathing space of 48 hours and then maybe you don't get either suicide or homicide. Um, I wasn't sure we were gonna have this discussion today, but I'll to chip in here, I feel like sold out. I mean, I literally busted chops last year on 441 and 221 after having listened to victims' advocates clearly telling us about the five days after a breakup in domestic violence situations. And I went not just to this committee several times. I went to the governor's office. I went to the speaker of the house. I went to the caucuses on both sides. Begged and pleaded for us to come to unity and universal vote on those two pieces of legislation. And 
it seems to me that both pieces of this particular bill are placing obstacles in the way of the very people we were trying to work so hard last time to protect. And we're basing it on the assumption that a given number of hours may, not shall, but may have an impact on a person's decision. And when I heard the Black's testimony, I came away feeling as if they knew ahead of time that there was a problem. This was not a complete surprise to them. They certainly were able to piece together as a result of his text messages and his social media contacts that there was a long period of time that he was actually contemplating this, even to the point where he had said, I'm giving myself, I don't know what it was, I can't remember, but it was 36 hours ago. But the bottom line was there was a clear uh, determination on his part to do something. So do we have a 48-hour waiting period, a 36, a 24, a 10-day? How do you predict ahead of time what somebody who is determined to end their lives will be the proper obstacle placed in front of them? And at the same time doing that, we're knowing that we are literally telling those people who might exercise their constitutional right for self-protection that they can't exercise that right unless there's a waiting period, whatever time we determine, that has been dispositive. And that I'm very troubled by that. So I, frankly, I can't support either one of the uh, provisions of this. And I should have added that when it comes to safe storage, a year ago I stood on the floor and I said I've never been a gun owner. I've told you all that now that has changed as a result of a rifle that was handed to us that came from my father-in-law. And that rifle is going to hang over our door frame. And it's something that we remember him by. And frankly, as I read this, I would automatically be somebody that's placed in violation of this law. And I'll tell you, I, I really reached the point where I say, come on and arrest me. This is going too far. I can't, for the life of me, support either one of those provisions. And I don't know where the committee's going to go with it, but Chair, I guess I'll have to give you a fair warning that when I get to the floor, if this is a subject for conversation, I'm going to be saying the same thing on the floor that I'm saying right now. I appreciate that. I don't know what gets to the floor. Certainly, I fear that if we do anything, and I've expressed this already, that if we do anything, we have no idea what might happen to the other body. For me, S55 was a eye What can happen? And if we feel it's the right thing to do, Do we have waiting periods for anything else 
that one might buy? Good question. Some states are just handguns. Well, well, on this one, I do feel like we need to clean up some of the things we didn't do right the last time. Why do you do that? I was. Yeah, maybe we can 